we are tired of their blah blah blah. Our leaders are not leading. Less talk, more action. People around the world demand progress at the COP26 climate conference in Glasgow. Scientists say the pledges so far don't go far enough. So what's needed to make that change? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Rob Matheson. The COP26 climate conference in Glasgow is at its halfway point. World leaders have spent the past week debating ways to cut carbon emissions and limit a global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. But many environmentalists say they're disappointed so far. What do we want? Climate justice! When do we want it? Now! Protesters held what they called a global day of action on Saturday. Hundreds of thousands of people rallied in cities including London, Seoul, Nairobi and Sydney. The largest was in central Glasgow. Demonstrators, many of them young people, demanded immediate action from governments. Yes, I'm angry. We've been saying this for years. We're at a point of no return, but governments are just not listening. Many schools are being destroyed because of extreme weather events. I need someone to tell me how to explain to farmers who are losing their crops and farms because of droughts and floods that seem to never end. The head of states didn't uh, do enough for climate this week at the COP26. And it's very uh, scandalous for us because it's a crime against humanity to do, uh, to do nothing against the destruction of life on Earth. I want my children to live on a beautiful planet in the future. Not only my children, but all the children, trees, birds, plants, and all the people. I think we have to leave a beautiful planet. I think we owe that to our children and the planet. Well, here's what's been pledged at the summit up to now. More than 100 countries have agreed to end deforestation and land degradation by 2030. 25 nations signed up to stop spending money on foreign fossil fuel projects by next year. And several governments have promised to phase out the use of coal in the coming 10 years for rich nations and in two decades for developing countries. They also said they'd cut methane gas emissions by at least 30%. But rich nations will have to pay more to help poorer ones tackle the climate crisis. Some wealthy governments have pledged to contribute towards a $100 billion fund set up for the developing world. OK, let's bring in our guests. In Glasgow, David Embargo Hakomi, he's a climate activist and a medical doctor. In Stirling, also in Scotland, Mark Ruskell, member of the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Green Party spokesperson on climate and the environment. And in Maputo, Mozambique, Dipti Batnaga, International Climate Justice and Energy Programme Coordinator at Friends of the Earth International. Welcome to the programme. Mark, I'm going to start with you. Were people confident at any stage that politicians at COP26 were actually going to be able to put together something that in practical terms was going to work? Um, I don't think the confidence has been there, no. And I think probably quite a lot of the blame for that has to come uh, at the door of the UK presidency. Um, I don't think we've seen the kind of intensity of diplomatic effort that we saw before the Paris Agreement six years ago, where the French state had hundreds and hundreds of bilateral meetings and multilateral meetings with parties ahead of that, that critical COP summit which delivered the Paris Agreement. Now, the, the UK government will say that there are reasons for that, um, the COVID crisis being one of those, but of course, COP was delayed uh, for a year. So, uh, you know, there is concern that um, despite the commitments we've seen this week, um, that this isn't going to match up. And I, and I think you know, the, the analysis from week one is already showing that the commitments that parties have already made only amounts to about 40% of the cuts of emissions that we're going to need to make desperately in the next 10 years to keep the world safe within 1.5 degrees of global heating. So we're, we're, we're not there yet. Uh, it feels that this is coming very late on. Uh, and clearly, if the world had started decades ago, we wouldn't be having this uh, scrabble at the moment to try and make commitments that are actually going to deliver us 
uh, and, and deliver what the science demands that we deliver. Mm. Dipti, the, the commonly held phrase is think global, act local. How much do political promises actually matter when it comes to tackling the results of climate change? The political promises do matter because it's what the countries are putting on the table because the climate crisis is really so inherently unjust. It affects those the most that have done the least to create it. So we need that leadership. We need those promises coming, especially from the rich countries who have done so much to create this crisis. But at the same time, we see that this is all hype. What's been coming out of the COP this week is so much hypocrisy, so much hype. The forest agreement, the, the fossil fuel agreement, there are so many loopholes and caveats in all of those that it really does, it, it really does feel like, you know, what we say is that people power is what's actually going to drive this transition and is going to bring justice. It's important for us to hold our leaders to account because we're the ones who elected them. They need to be responsible to us, the people, not the polluters. At the same time, we know that it's people all across the world, the 150,000 that marched in Glasgow yesterday, all of those that marched all across the world, that's who's going to really bring this, this transformation that we need. David, um, Dipti's just talking about those protests that we saw in Glasgow there. We mentioned before that many of the people who were protesting were young people. Now, we often talk about young people putting climate change as a priority, but aren't we specifically talking about young people in rich countries. One would imagine that younger people in poorer countries don't really have the option or perhaps even the ability or even the, the intention to deal with climate change because their needs are so much more of a priority to them. Yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely right. And it is sad to say that for me, this is one of the events where I have seen the less amount of diversity ever. Uh, unfortunately, that lack of participation and the attendance themselves of, of, of people from uh, low and middle income countries reflects also on the type of discussions that we're having. I do feel like uh, the, the type of discussions that, are, that I have heard in the past uh, few days are mostly uh, related to high income countries, uh, talking about solutions that might work in, in countries where there is more resources for sure, there is more adaptation already in place. Uh, but might, might not be feasible in, in settings that are still facing issues such as maternal mortality, children, uh, nutrition being an issue. So that is still a, a, a complicated matter, I feel. Uh, we have heard that this is the most exclusive COP ever. Uh, I definitely agree. Uh, and, and this is unfortunate because we are here to make, to make progress and we need to have the, the, the people uh, who are facing the, the, the consequences of climate change as part of the discussion here, they should be the ones who are explaining what the, what the issue is. Uh, they should be the ones explaining uh, what are the, the, the solutions that are feasible right now, but it's not happening, unfortunately. Dipti, how much of a problem do you think it is that people who are often discussing um, climate change, certainly those with the highest profile discussing climate change, are very often the ones least likely to see the impact that it actually has when we talk about rivers and seas drying up and animals dying? This is a real crisis because we really need to hear from the frontline communities, indigenous peoples, local communities who are whose bodies are on the front line of this crisis. And, and it's not just this crisis, right? The climate crisis is not separated from so many other crises that people are facing. An energy crisis, how many people across the globe, 800 million do not have access to electricity, biodiversity crises. So people are, who are on the front lines of these crises really must be the ones that we hear from. And your question to David was really beautiful because th there are so many youth also in our southern countries. It is difficult to be an activist in many of our countries because livelihood and survival sometimes take priority. But we forget that there are youth and, and, and so many vulnerable communities in the frontline communities that are facing coal and gas extraction. And these, these youth are also fighting back. We see this here in Mozambique. Uh, my organization, Justice Ambiental, which is Friends of the Earth Mozambique, is working with youth in impacted communities to be able to raise their voices because it's absolutely critical that the leaders hear from people who are most impacted by these crises. Mark, one of the phrases that is used more often these days is climate fatigue, of, of course. Now, are we seeing a fatigue with the discussions around climate change? Or are we seeing fatigue with what some see as the empty promises being made by corporations and by politicians? 
Um, I mean, I don't think we're seeing fatigue with the debate. Uh, I mean, at all levels of society around the world, you know, climate change and the impacts of climate change are being discussed. You know, I, I spent a good uh, few days in the run-up to COP going into schools um, in Scotland and listening to the amazing ideas that young people are having, you know, even sort of eight, nine-year-olds are, are, are coming up with in relation to how we can make easy changes to tackle climate change. So I think the important thing um, is that we listen to those voices. And what I'm seeing around Glasgow at the moment and around the world is a lot of innovation, a lot of uh, citizens' assemblies coming together, uh, sometimes sponsored by government, to actually work out you know, the best way to cut emissions, the best way to adapt to the climate change that is coming. And I think the critical thing here now is for governments beyond these two weeks in Glasgow to listen to their citizens, listen to some of the challenges um, that people are facing at the moment in terms of adapting to climate change, but also listen to their thoughts around how we can put in place solutions. Um, you know, we've had a good debate here in Scotland around free bus travel, for example, for young people. It's something that young people have been telling us directly that they want to see delivered so they can cut climate emissions, but also give them the opportunities for education uh, and work, which, which otherwise they would struggle with. So that's something that you know, the Greens and government are delivering here. But we, we need, a, we need a, a much deeper dialogue with citizens around the world about the impacts, about how we adapt to them. Um, but also listen to the solutions. Uh, I think one of the most inspiring things I've heard this week has been the contribution of indigenous leaders uh, around the world who have a very different way of thinking, um, but they can also come up with the solutions as well, which are not just for the here and now, but for multiple generations to come. And given that indigenous people uh, their lands cover about 80% of the world's biodiversity. If we don't listen to indigenous leaders, we're not going to find the solutions to tackle both the climate and the nature emergencies. Mm. You've been, uh, you're obviously there. Um, where do you think the breakdown happens between politicians, between corporations and the grassroots, as it were, sources of information, like the indigenous people you were talking about, who are able to provide this kind of information? What, what's why is that line broken? Why is that link not working? We need new ways of, of engaging with citizens around the world. And I think that's why some of the climate citizen assemblies uh, that have been, been working around the world have been very successful. The one in France, for example, recommended to their government that they should be curbing uh, and restricting the growth of uh, domestic flights. And the government listened to that and they, and they, they took action. Um, but, but I think, of course, there's an elephant in the room here in Glasgow, and, and it's the corporations. It's those vested interests that need legally to appease their shareholders and, of course, are working behind the scenes um, to come up with false solutions that they want to see governments push. And although I've not seen uh, stands from oil and gas corporations inside COP this week, it's very clear that their agenda is written through a lot of the energy strategies and climate strategies of all the governments um, that, that we see in, in, in attendance. So, you know, there, 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 is a, there is another dialogue here, which is with those powerful corporations that clearly... Uh, want to resist change. Some of them, of course, are prepared to move fast enough and decarbonise, but others have got assets that they want to hang on to and they want to keep extracting oil and gas until every single last drop is, is gone. Mm. Do you think that seeing, for want of a better phrase, superstar climate change activists like Greta Thunberg and others, of course, does that inspire people? Or do you think that that intimidates people, that perhaps on an individual basis they feel that they can't do anything and because the only way to get anything done is to have that kind of platform? I definitely think that it's inspiring uh, to see young people leading the, the climate change movement right now. Um, but I do think that it also reflects that the climate change issue is an, inter is an, is an issue of injustice. I think that climate change is the biggest intergenerational injustice that we have ever seen. And it, it requires for young people and adolescents to actually like step up and go into the streets and go into school strikes. It's a huge indicator of how bad the situation is right now uh, and how much, how, much every, how much action is needed to take place immediately. Um, unfortunately, I, I do think that representation matters. And we should be also, as I said before, including uh, faces from the global south who are also uh, doing amazing work at the local and, and regional level in terms of being climate change activists, uh, working with grassroots organiza organizations. And we have making some progress, that is for sure. I mean, we have, for example, Vanessa Nakate, who was also um, a part of the, of the different uh, strikes in these couple of days uh, and has been doing an amazing work or, uh, as well. 
but we can definitely do better uh, in terms of bringing voices from the global south into the into the climate change movement and, and raising those voices as well. Dipti, let's talk a, a, a more about the messaging because the media uses words like crisis and catastrophe, disaster and fight when it comes to tackling climate change. How much do you think that has an impact on the way that people respond to climate change? That's a great question because what we are seeing is a trotting out of this fear narrative, this despair and desperation narrative, and that is very disempowering. So we actually, as climate activists, we fight against that because we talk about what Mark was saying, that there are communities that are making real change right now on the ground, and they've been doing it for a long time. There are communities who are running uh, renewable energy cooperatives. There are communities who are taking food production into their hands and, and doing that in a good way, stopping deforestation. You know, th there are communities fighting for gender justice and, and about the valuing of care work. So all of this is happening. And and we know that that is what we need to be supporting. And I also wanted to respond to your question to David, if you don't mind. The issue of the leaders, the personality, I think it's very inspiring that Vanessa and Greta are up there and, and speaking. We need to have so many more of those wonderful young women and men standing up and talking about the need for, for people power. We need so many more people to be joining this conversation. And it is very inspiring to see a few people you know, to be able to to see how they get traction in this way. But at the same time, we need to be recognizing the beauty and value of, of what each person brings into this fight, because it's going to take all of us to have this transformation. It's system change that we're trying to bring about. It is really big, and it seems daunting, for sure. System change, you know, all of this seems really daunting. But we just can't give in to that fear narrative. It's meant to divide us. We need to be really talking about the things that unite us, the, 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 the beauty that's in the world, the work that's already happening on the ground. And, and again, going back to the, the issue of the frontline communities, those are the voices that we need to be hearing and lifting up, because that is what we should be valuing. Mark, how easy do you think it would be to turn the messaging around, and why hasn't it happened before? I mean, I, I, I would agree with Desi that, that there's there are incredibly positive things happening around the world, and I, and I think it, you know, now in a multimedia age, um, you know, you only have to go on your phone, on on Twitter and other social media platforms, YouTube, and you can find the most incredible stories. I think the key thing is to now amplify those voices, and I think for governments to help to empower their citizens as well. So one one thing that we've had in Scotland for a while is a climate challenge fund where community groups can bid into this fund and they can do all sorts of amazing things. They can help um, people in, in fuel poverty with energy efficiency work, or they can set up a bicycle recycling initiative or food production or whatever. And I think it's for governments to really empower people. Um, I, I mean, I think in terms of narrative, there's, um, you know, there's obviously, we've seen the most devastating images this year, particularly floods in Germany, wildfires in the Arctic as well. And I think that there is an element of fear there. But I think, you know, while we accept that, we need to very quickly move on and recognise that actually in adapting to climate change and in tackling our emissions, we can make the world a fairer and a better place. And, you know, we live in remarkable times. There's incredible amounts of innovation happening everywhere within society at the moment. And there's the opportunity to make our lives much better and much fairer as a result. But there will be some battles along the way. And, you know, what I see yesterday in, in the streets in Glasgow was, was anger, but I also saw uh, a lot of hope uh, and, and a lot of credibility from people, a lot of knowledge about how to tackle these this uh, climate crisis and how to come out of it with a better society that's focused much more on our well-being and human values rather than just endless economic growth. Mm. David, do you think it would be more effective if we stopped saying we're trying to solve the climate crisis and started talking about managing climate change? Because solving the climate crisis right now seems like an enormous and almost impossible task. Managing it and dealing with it sounds a little bit easier. Yeah, I think that the messaging uh, definitely needs to change. Um, unfortunately, I, I, I do think that health is not included in the, in the climate change discourse right now as much as it should be, uh, because climate change is a health crisis, actually. I mean, so imagine if we start to start treating uh, climate change uh, the same way that we treat COVID, for example, as something that is affecting the entire world. 
and there's something that is slowly killing us every day. I mean, air pollution is basically killing us slowly every day, and it's getting worse. So that means that, for example, children uh, and adolescents are are actually being receiving more air pollution every day, and since it's getting worse, it will affect them more as well. So I definitely think that the message needs, needs to change. Um, extreme weather events are still also increasing. It will cause people to die. And not only, I mean, besides dying, there's also some so many other consequences to these extreme weather events. For example, the effects on education that it was mentioned before as well. Uh, imagine how many clo uh, schools will be closing due to extreme weather events and how that will also increase, uh, impact education and how education is also linked to gender inequality and so many other consequences. So I do think that the message is, the messaging needs to change to treating climate change, uh, the climate change crisis as a health crisis to begin with, and also start discussing what can we do now immediately? Because yes, we can say a lot of things that will be happening by 2030 or 2040, 2050, but we need actions that are taking going to take place right now that are effective and that actually are feasible to start with. Mm. Deputy, I know you want to come in there. What, what would you like to say? When we talk about saving the climate or saving the planet, it seems really daunting. I think we should be talking about for everyone to have a life of dignity. That's what's important. Every single person on this planet, we talk about energy sufficiency. You know, there should be enough for everyone, but not abused by some. I think that's what we need to be talking about. You know, th these numbers that they, that they talk about, 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, those are lives that we are that, that that it really means. You know, when we say, oh, we can't we can't keep it to 1.5, but maybe we'll keep the global temperature rise under two degrees. What we are effectively saying is that so many people will die. We're willing for them to die because we're not, you know, we're not willing to to hold the line. We need to be talking, we need to be talking about how we can have lives of dignity for everyone on this planet, that everyone has the basics of transport, what, what Mark was talking about, you know, transport in Scotland, so that everyone can have energy and food and and transportation, communication, the basics that people need and, and that they have enough. I think that's what the conversation really needs to be about. This isn't a, something in the future. This is about so many injustices that are taking place now and have been happening for the last 500 years. And when we put that in context, we realize that we need to be supporting everyone to have a better life, those who do not have it at the moment and those who are in excess, to look at the fact that that's not necessary. We don't actually need to have people with so much excess. That We should be looking at, at everyone to have a good life. You know what, what in, in Southern Africa, the concept of Ubuntu is often talked about, which is I am because we are. We look at ourselves as interconnected, and, and we are connected not just to ourselves, but also to the planet. Mark, we, we've been talking a lot about the, the level of messaging here. One of the key elements of messaging, of, of course, is know your audience. We've done a lot of research globally to, into climate change. We know a lot about how that is happening. Do we need to do more research, do you think, into how people are actually responding so the messaging can be better targeted? Well, I, I, I think perhaps some of the, the the concerns here around, you know, what 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 is the purpose of that messaging? So, you know, if if the message here is that actually it's down to you as everyday citizens to do your bit to tackle climate change, um, then that's all about the behavioural change of the individual. I, I think where my analysis would come from is to say that, uh, as being said already, that we need to put in place the system changes in order to tackle climate change. So, you know, if, if, if you're living in a, in a in fuel poverty in a tenement in Glasgow, um, you, your, your choices uh, to change your heating system or, or to do things differently to cut your emissions are extremely limited. Um, if you have a change in the energy system, if you have a government that will support you to make your house more efficient, then that's the kind of system change that we need to tackle climate change. So well, we're going to I leave think it there's a recognition because unfortunately we've run out of time. But I want to thank you very much indeed for your, your contribution. And I want to thank all our guests, David Embargo Hakomi, Mark Rascal and Deepti Batnago for being with us. And of course, thank you to you two for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Rob Matheson, and the whole team here, bye for now.